All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Let's see how this goes today. So, first of all, welcome to, or welcome back. I usually start with, right? Welcome back to Algorithms and Data Structures. Week six, where we talk about hash sets and hash maps, though in a slightly different format than you might be used to. Now let's quickly get this first bit out of the way first. Uh, we're using Twitch today, as those of you who are here have noticed. Let's start with some simple questions. Can you see me and can you hear me? For those of you that are in Twitch chat, I hope that we can use Twitch chat to have some sort of interaction. I can ask you some questions. You can give me some answers. Good. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now, you may have also noticed that I've set up feedback fruits. Um, so feedback fruits should, fingers crossed, uh, work as usual. Uh, our code today is QLJ. You can join that for the multiple choice questions. If at any point you have any questions uh, about the material I'm discussing, feel free to just post them in Twitch chat. I won't always take a look at it, uh, but at least at certain intervals, I'll try to take a look and see if there's anything I missed, anything I need to discuss. Now, let's see if this works. It seems to. So, in the course so far, we've talked about lists, stacks, priority queues, and trees, a uh, bunch of algorithms as well, binary search, sorting algorithms, closed pair of points, stuff like that. Um, and you've had two exams last week. Uh, more on that in just a moment. Today, we're going to be talking about hash maps um, and the topic of hashing. So we're going to finally going to figure out how this other data structure that you've been using for a while in Python called a dictionary, uh, how that thing actually works. And later this week, we'll talk about graphs. And that's pretty much what we'll be doing for the next two weeks, uh, after which we'll talk a little bit about P versus NP. And that's it. So before we delve in, some announcements slash other things I quickly want to discuss. As I mentioned, this is something new. I've only done one other one of these sessions last Friday uh, with the computer science students. And so far, you are behaving much better than they were. Uh, so that's very nice to see. Perhaps the group is also a little bit smaller. Um, the exams, of course, are, or the final exams of the course will be in week nine, or at least that's when they were planned. Um, as you know, or as you hopefully know, there are um, these new regulations in place with no on-campus education, which means that uh, I don't know yet about the exams, uh, whether they can or cannot be held. But as soon as I know something, I will definitely let you know. Um, what else? Well, in the meantime, I will try to continue our sessions as much as possible. So what does that mean? Well, during scheduled hours, uh, like today's lectures hours, um, and also the tutorial hours, there will be activities. Uh, we'll see whether Twitch continues working for us or maybe we find something better over the next few days, something that allows us to have more yeah, interaction where possible. Um, I will be recording these. So for some of you that were already asking me, uh, yes, I am currently recording this and I will upload the entirety to YouTube. Um, that being said, last year all the lectures were lect recorded in an actual lecture hall. So I can imagine that might be slightly better quality material. Um, so those are available to you as well, of course. Uh, you should continue doing your homework in the meantime. Uh, we will be providing week six in WebLab as soon as possible. Uh, I've been quite busy preparing all kinds of weird stuff like this. Uh, but the exercise should be available to you soon. Of course, there's always the books, uh, as well as just the lecture slides. And if you have any questions, uh, always feel free to ask them on the Brightspace forum. Now, for the lab sessions on Wednesday and Friday, uh, we will also have to see a bit how it goes. I posted an announcement about them, uh, which you probably read, because otherwise you wouldn't be here now. 
Uh, I'll be setting up the queue and you can use that in combination with Talkie to get some uh, voice time with TAs if needed. Now, what else did I want to discuss? Well, you've had midterms uh, last week. Uh, my plan was originally to grade all of them on Friday. Unfortunately, last Friday I've had to lecture for three hours using this material or this method as well. Uh, so that's going to take a little bit longer than I planned. I hope to have the results to you by, at the end of this week. Uh, but, well, as I wrote, uh, no promises. It really depends on how this week is going to pan out with all of these uh, unexpected challenges coming our way. Uh, was there anything else? Yes. So while we have Feedback Foods working, let's see if we can actually properly make this work. I see only 10 people have connected. So I'll skip the statistics slides. But for those of you who are here, if you join us on QLJ, you can give me some quick feedback on the written exam. So many of you already gave some feedback on the computer exam because there was a small questionnaire in WebLab available, but not yet on the written one. So let's see if we can make this work. Yes, ah, suddenly 32 people in Feedback Fruits. That's quite a bit more than 10, okay. Feedback Fruits should be happy to hear your answer now. Okay, a couple more seconds to give me an answer if you have one. Now let's see. Yes, okay, so I did this well. I was hiding the stats for these. Since it's only a small group, I wasn't sure whether I should publish this on the internet live. Uh, I can let you know the outcome of this via Brightspace later if you're interested. A okay, couple more seconds for this second question about the length of the written exam. Okay. All right, so this question will come up later. So let me start by saying thank you for your feedback. Uh, now, of course, normally at the start of the lecture, I would also ask, do you have any questions at the moment? I can imagine you might have. Uh, so if you do, feel free to type them into Twitch chat and I can see if I can answer one or two. If we have no questions over the next 20 seconds or so, we'll just get started. Yeah, Jochem, so the, about the final exam, uh, I really don't know. Um, at this point, all I can say is that I'm awaiting instructions from this from the university. Um, I assume that they will come up with a plan on how and when we are going to take exams for the courses. Uh, until I hear from them, unfortunately, I have no answers for you. But as soon as I do, I will, of course, let you know. Uh, real Daniel, uh, for the implementation test, is it possible to get points while you have zero points on the spec tests? Yes. Um, so I've been grading some assignments already. Um, and indeed, there have been situations where you, people would fail all the spec tests because they flipped around an if statement or something like this. Um, right? It should have been if blah smaller than, but instead they did if blah larger than. Um, but this can still definitely get you a number of points. Uh, how long will the stream last? Uh, well, the, so the idea is that we mimic a lecture as much as possible, uh, meaning 45 minutes, then a break of 15 minutes, and then another 45 minutes. That being said, today's material might be slightly less than one and a half hours, uh, in which case, uh, we will stop a little bit earlier. 
But the idea, the plan is to have just a, a regular lecture, only instead of us sitting in a lecture hall, we're doing it like this. All right, I see no more questions coming in for the moment. So I suggest we just try to get started. So today uh, we are going to talk about hashing and hash maps. Now, uh, I've been grading your exams a bit and I've been using a tool called Zesje that you are probably familiar with because I believe some of my colleagues from mathematics also use this. For example, Foco uh, probably used it. Um, Zesje is a great tool, right? It allows me to scan your exams uh, and then grade them uh, digitally. But Zesha also has uh, a challenge to face, right? So uh, we have a number of exams. And what we want to do is efficiently access your exam based on your student number or even based on your name. Um, so for example, um, if I wanted to access skills exam, I would put in skills name uh, and try to uh, access their exam that way. But all the data structures we've studied so far I say all, but most of them have been list-based, right, or tree-based. They seem to rely on some sort of notion of a, an index or a place in the tree. So how can we transform a name or a large number effic efficiently into one of these places? Well, one thing we could try um, is just have an array-based list, right? Um, if I know your student number, I can just use that as the index of the data and I can find it in constant time. That sounds good, except that well, all your student numbers are around the 50,000 range. So I need a huge array to keep track of all of your data where I'm not using any of the first part. You might say, okay, so just subtract whatever the smallest number is from all of the numbers, right? So number 50,000 becomes number zero. That could work. However, your student numbers are also what we well non-contiguous, right? So there might be large gaps between two student numbers. And that means that there would still be a lot of wasted space here. So what could we do to avoid this? Well, you probably already know a solution. Uh, we could use a dictionary in Python. Dictionaries allow us to use any index we like. Uh, it could even be a string, it could be uh, a number, it could be anything really. And that sounds great, but the question is, how does that even work, right? Uh, is it actually better than having this massive list? So that's what we're going to be talking about today, figuring out uh, how this dictionary works and why it is better to use than an array-based list for data like this. All right, let's see if we can get that going. So let's talk about maps. Now, how, why am I going to talk about maps? Because unfortunately, uh, the name that Python chose for its dictionary is a bit unfortunate. Many other programming languages, and especially, let's say, the more theoretical computer science, they refer to this data structure that Python calls a dictionary, they call it a map. So when I talk about maps, I mean what we call the abstract data type, um, that a dictionary is one form of in Python. For instance, in Java, this thing is called a, a map. Um, in C Sharp, it's called a dictionary again. So all of these things have different names for it. But the core principle is what we call the map ADT, the map abstract data type. So how do maps work? Well, they require key value pairs. Um, and what do they do? Well, we can ask for the number of tuples in a map. We can get a certain value for a certain key. We can put a certain key uh, together with a certain value. I've put the abstract data type syntax on the left and the Python equivalent for a dictionary on the right. And we can remove uh, certain tuples with certain keys, as well as check whether a tuple with a certain key is present. All right, so these are the functions that we're going to be focusing on when looking at our map ADT. Now let's take a look at how we could implement such a map. So one thing we could do is simply use uh, an array as our underlying data structure. Right, so 
something we could do is just use one of these array-based lists. Um, and then we could implement stuff like get, remove, and contains. The question is, however, what would the time complexity of these functions be? Now, feedback sh fruits should be happy to hear your answer. So I'll give you half a minute to a minute to try and give me one. Right, just a little bit more. If you have an answer, give it now. And let's take a look. Okay, three quarters of you for theta n linear time. Yeah, so remember, um, that our array, if we just throw a bunch of tuples in that, or in our list, uh, all we have is this one large sequence of, of tuples. And in order to find them based on a key, what would we have to do? Well, we'd have to go through all of them uh, and look for the right one, right? So we'd have to check every single object just to see, okay, is this a tuple with the right key? So, well, this could work. Right, it would be an implementation of a map, but hopefully, especially since dictionaries are used quite a lot, we can do something a little bit more efficient. Well, we can, that's uh, what we're going to discuss, right? So, can we do better? Well, there's a couple of things uh, that we could try. How about, for example, we still use our list based structure, but instead of just throwing all the tuples in there, we instead have the key of our tuple determine where it goes in the array. So consider, for example, that I want to store, um, uh, let's say, phone numbers uh, together with names. Then the phone number could somehow determine where in the array base at structure the index goes. There is a small problem, however, because what if I want to do this the other way around? So what if I want to store names and associate phone numbers with them? So I want to have my names as the keys. I mean, a string isn't something I can use as a number uh, in the form of an index in my array. So I somehow need to translate that, that string, that name, that whatever it might be, into an integer. Well, and that's what we can do with hashing. So hashing is a way to transform uh, yeah, pretty much anything into a number in a certain range. Example, uh, a hash function takes some key and it uh, transforms it into an integer in a certain range. Now consider this, f of k equals one for any key k. Is this a hash function for n equals 100? I'll give you, our feedback fruit should be open now to hear your answers. And I'll give you 20 seconds, 30 seconds to give me one.
right, five more seconds to give me an answer if you have one. And let's take a look. Okay, 70% for yes, but 30% uh, for no and I don't know. Um, so remember a hash function, or well, remember, I've only just told you, but a hash function only needs to do one thing, right? Take a certain key and transform it into an integer between zero and n minus one. In this case, between zero and 100, or zero and 99. Um, so that means that yes, this is a hash function, it does what it needs to do, but it is quite a terrible hash function. Um, now why is that? Well, let's take a look at what kind of properties we want these hash functions to have. I want to use my hash function to map a key to an index in a hash table, or in one of these arrays. From now on we'll call them hash tables. So for example, um, imagine that I'm storing both the names Stefan and Kevin together with a phone number. Then I would ideally want Stefan and Kevin to map to different indices of my table. Why is that? Well, if I put them in the same place, we get what we call a conflict. And conflicts are quite a problem. Now consider another hash function, right? Um, I've taken six letters. P I G L E T, um, and I've defined my hash function for them. Then a hash table would look something like this. The hash of P is 1, so I put the P in index 1. The hash of I is 3, so I put the I in index 3. The hash of E is 5, so I put the E in index 5. Now consider that we have a conflict. For example, if we take this, this horrible function from earlier, uh, or if we take a slightly different one, right? So what do we do if we have conflicts? Well, let's say we have E, Y, O, and R, but E and O both map, or sorry, Y and O both map to uh, index three. So they map to the same number. What would happen? Well, we would have a hash table that looks something like this. Instead of just putting a single element in every uh, box of our array, every box of our array contains a list, and we can add new elements to that list as required. So in this case, Y and O can both be put in this list of box 3. Are there any questions about this so far? So the idea of using a hash function to translate a certain key into an index, based on this hash, that's where we put the element in our table. And if we have conflicts, then we create a list instead and we append all of the items with the same hash to that list. I see only silence in chat, so I'm assuming no questions for now. All right. So we have this. Um, ah, OK. One question from Gideon just came in. So how does a computer store that data? Uh, so what it could do, um, right, is it could, could allocate an array uh, and use the, in the, the places in that array um, to be pointers to actual bits of data. So it becomes a bit technical then, uh, perhaps more technical than is required for this course. Um, but yeah, so what we could have is we have an array of pointers to lists. And if we want to add something to element number three, I go to the third thing in my array, I take that pointer to the list and then I can put stuff in that list. Does that make sense? Meanwhile, if other people have questions, you can type them now, otherwise we're going to move on. Good, Gideon, good to hear it was somewhat clear. All right, let's move on then. 
Now, um, the idea is then we have a certain hash table, an array of a certain capacity, and we use the hash to determine where the item goes. And every entry could use some list, and we often use linked lists here, uh, linked lists of values. Now, consider our terrible hash function from before, f of k equals 1 for all keys. What is the time complexity of getting the right value uh, for a key? Feedback Fruits is happy to hear your thoughts. All right, 10 more seconds to give me an answer if you have one. And let's take a look. Ah, again, an overwhelming majority for theta n. Yes, you are quite right. Um, so why is that? Well, we put everything with the same key into a massive list. Uh, so if everything has, or sorry, everything with the same hash, we put in the same list. So if every key gets mapped to the same hash value, everything is going to be in the same index. Everything is going to be in that one list. So indeed, getting something else in that case still requires going through that entire list and seeing is it in there or not. So that would indeed still be linear time. And that's where we get some inspiration for some nice properties of these hash functions. So hash functions should map uh, each key to an integer. This remains unchanged. But we have some, let's say, properties that make hash functions better than others. So for example, ideally, we hope that keys are uniformly distributed over the range. In this way, we can ensure that these extra list that we create of these conflicts is as, are as small as possible. Similarly, we hope that it's a deterministic function, meaning that when two objects are equal, their hashes are also always equal. And if I call the hash function again, I get the same value, right? So both deterministic as well as um, for equal objects, their hashes are also equal. And finally, it would be great if we can efficiently compute the hash function, right? If the hash function requires quadratic time to compute for whatever weird thing I'm throwing in, um, that wouldn't be great. So preferably, um, it is a very efficient and quick thing to compute. Now, this makes our uh, f of k equals one pretty terrible. So why is that? What is the property that it breaks? Uh, I don't have this in feedback fruits, but let's see if we can use chat for quick interaction like this as well. Fingers crossed. Okay, I see some answers coming in. So the answers I see so far are at least agreeing. Uh, ah, okay, no, we have some disagreement. Good, good. Yeah, so uh, let's start with the first property, right? Keys are uniformly distributed. That's not the case here. Everything maps to the same value. Um, so that's gonna be a problem. The second one, notice that it's only an implication, right? If two objects are equal, then their hashes should be equal. It doesn't say that when the hashes are equal, the object should be equal. And so our terrible function still at least adheres to this property because when two keys are equal, their hash will be equal. In fact, everything is gonna be 
uh, equal. All the hashes are going to be equal. Uh, Finstar, I'm sorry that the cam's lagging. Uh, I don't have a webcam, so the thing I'm using now is my phone, and sometimes that uh, doesn't work great. So apologies for that, and I'm afraid there's at the moment nothing I can do about it. Um, Jochem, you were asking, what does it mean to be uniformly distributed? So ideally, when I put in, um, in the ideal, ideal scenario, when I put in n different items, they all map to a different index. So one maps to index zero, one of them maps to index one, one of them maps to index two. Um, and when I put in two n items, then we have two everywhere, right? So that's the real ideal scenario. They are nicely, yeah, what we call uniformly distributed over the entire range. Uh, as for the second property, so like I said, it's only an implication, not a by implication. Now, why wouldn't the reverse work? Why couldn't we say that when two hashes are equal, the objects must also be equal? Why is that going to be problematic? It seems that the, the delay in Twitch is a little bit worse than it was on Friday. Yeah, exactly, Browhat. So indeed, uh, a problem could be that if I have more than n different objects, I'm going to run out of hashes. Um, and this is a, a very common problem with uh, hash tables, with maps, um, that we have more uh, elements that we want to store than that we have uh, a range for our hash function. And that's why we keep this only a one-way implication. Right, so when two objects are equal, their hash should be equal, but the reverse doesn't have to be true. Two objects could have the same hash, but be different. Okay, these are some properties that we ideally want hash functions to have. Now let's see then how we can uh, use them. So uh, in Python, we can implement a hash function. So consider uh, a class point that has two properties, a value x and a value y, then our hash could, for instance, be uh, just add them together. Uh, ideally, maybe you could also still modulo this uh, with some n, right, to ensure that they are always between uh, 0 and n minus 1. I see the cam is, again, struggling a bit. I'll see if I can do something about that during the break. Uh, yeah, so one way to do it is just to add x and y together. Alternatively, uh, I could do something like this. I could multiply x by 31, multiply y by 7, and then add them together. Now, the, the one on the right is something you'll often find uh, different programs do. So, for example, um, Python will use something like this to keep track uh, of hashes of maybe strings do something with where in the list the string is uh, instead of just adding all of them together. Now, that might just be good, but uh, yeah, we have two options here. Which one's better? The right is something that is perhaps more commonly used, but the left is also definitely a valid hash function. So which one would we pick? Feedback Fruits is happy to hear your answer. All right, five more seconds to give me an answer if you have one. And 
let's take a look. Very nice, very nice split between the different answers. So I'd argue here that the right answer is answer C. I don't know, or rather, of course, it depends. Um, it depends on what kind of points we expect to see. So a downside to the one on the left is uh, that the one on the left has simply, well, simply the summation of x and y. Meaning if I have the point 3, 4 and the point 4, 3, where only the x and y coordinates are swapped, they're going to have the same hash value. The one on the right, however, uh, right, this, this way for you, because the webcam is mirrored for some reason, uh, the one on the right doesn't suffer from this issue. If I only swap x and y around, I get a completely different hash. So it really depends on the kind of points we expect to see. If we expect to see a lot of points that are each other's mirroring, if you want, mirrored in the x, y, uh, x equals y axis, x equals y line, um, then the one on the left is going to be pretty terrible. But if we see many different points that are, well, coincidentally adhering to the function on the right, so every time x decreases by 1, i decreases by something else to compensate for this, um, then the one on the right is going to be pretty bad. So it really depends on the number of points or the, the way the points are distributed. If you want, you can write a bit of code uh, to count the number of conflicts. right? So you can just uh, compute the hashes for a bunch of points and see, okay, how many map to the same value. A little bit more about that in today's intermezzo after the break. So both are valid hash functions. Both could be good hash functions. They try to make different points map to different values. Um, but which one is better really depends on how the points are distributed. Uh, ah, I see that I had already planned to go into today's intermezzo here. But we have a bit of time left before the break. Um, yeah, okay. Why not do today's intermezzo before the break rather than after then today? So, just before the break, time for today's intermezzo. And let's talk about hashing um, in the real world. So, there's many different standard hashing algorithms around. You may have heard of MD5 at some point or of SHA, all kinds of uh, cryptographic hashes um, and someone uh, or well, all of these methods all do their own thing. The great thing about hashes or rather about proper hashes, cryptographic hashes, is that they really are one-way functions. So given a key we can compute its hash but given a hash we cannot compute the key. Now a user on Stack Exchange did a brilliant comparison. I've linked the thing in the, in the slide title. Um, and it turns out that there's many hashing algorithms that perform great on, for example, strings, but not on numbers, or the other way around. There are um, some that can sort of, let's say, benefit from the fact that they have collisions. They take this into account in their computations. Um, there are some that are really, really fast to compute but as a result, they will have more collisions. There are some that are much slower to compute, but have fewer collisions. So this is always a sort of trade-off you can make, right? For, consider, for example, our fk equals one function. That can be really fast. Uh, it's constant time. It's the easiest thing in the world. Just return one, but it will have a whole bunch of collisions. But as it turns out, uh, hashing is something that can also be of major importance when designing a new programming language. So um, remember that a hash function should spread them as uniformly as possible, as equally as possible. Well, someone who was working on the dictionary equivalent in the language C sharp made a small mistake in the way that hashes were computed there. You might think, okay, but that's not great, right? Uh, especially since it's in a language, so really everyone using the language will suffer from this. Yeah, it, it wasn't great because as it turned out, it brought down msn.com. 
to the point where it was so slow that it wasn't usable anymore. This was back in 2003 when MSN.com was actually still really a thing. Um, because for whatever reason, and I, I haven't been able to quite figure out exactly what the reason is, um, this website had a dictionary to store every zip code in the United States. And due to this mistake that the developer made in the C-sharp implementation of the dictionary, every time someone loaded the web page, the server would try to compute this dictionary. It would run into a whole bunch of collisions due to this faulty hash function, and as a result, become very, very slow. I thought, okay, that, that's very nice, but it's all the way back from 2003. Let's see if we can still replicate this. So I set up a small experiment. Um, where I created uh, two classes, a class bad that can store a, for a value x, uh, and as its hash uses our terrible hash function, so whatever the value x is, it will always return one, and I'm going to try and store a thousand of these objects in a dictionary. Then, I also have good, which instead of returning one, is going to hash x, and whatever ha x's hash is, use that as the key for a dictionary. So if x is a number, uh, it will just hash this number. If it's a string, it will use Python's implementation of the string hash, whatever works. And then I've timed it, which you can do with a great uh, library called timeout. And you can see that even for just a thousand objects, the difference is insane. It's 7.6 seconds for putting a thousand elements in there all with the same hash, and it's only 0 0.4 seconds for putting a thousand elements in there with all a uh, different hash, or well, at least a proper hash, right? It doesn't all have to be different, but it's at least properly hashed. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, the takeaway is that when you implement your own class in Python, something that arguably you might not do a lot, but take a quick look at how you could implement that hash function, especially if you want to use it in dictionaries. Because the choice you make there as a programmer, right? How do you hash your object can really, really affect the runtime of some code that's using these as keys in a dictionary. All right, now let's see. I also set up feedback fruit to allow you to ask me questions. I think it should be this one. Okay, but maybe that hasn't been working. Uh, we have a couple minutes left before the break. Uh, if you have uh, any questions that I can answer now, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm going to send us off into a break. So I'll give it a little bit of time here to see if any of you have any questions to ask so far. Doesn't look like it. So in that case, uh, ah, okay. One quick question just uh, at the end from Browhead again. Uh, is this what they use for cryptographic hash function for, for example, Bitcoins? Well, so for Bitcoins, hopefully they use something far more advanced than the stuff I'm going to be showing you. Um, but this is the same idea. So this is also uh, uh, the idea of taking some, yeah, what we usually call a private key, something that so no one is allowed to know about, uh, and only share its hash. And the uh, instead of wanting the property of uniformly distributing them so we can use them in a dictionary, the main importance there is that given the hash, we cannot reproduce the original key. Uh, and this is something that's used in all cryptographic hash functions, this notion. Um, including uh, the ones related to bitcoins. Uh, what else was I going to say about this? Yes, and this all ties in very nicely with the last topic of the course that we will be discussing. So in the last week, we will be discussing P versus NP, and we can talk a little bit more about hash functions then. Because this really relies on the fact that going one way is easy, but going back the other way is going to be hard. All right. With that, let's send us into a break.
uh, I'll try to stick around uh, a little bit to answer questions in chat if you have any questions during the break, uh, but otherwise I'll see you back about 15 minutes from now.
All right, so welcome back and let's try to get started again. Now, before we begin, thanks for sticking around. I realized that Twitch might not be ideal as a lecturing platform, but I think so far we're making it work. I hope that for the people that had some questions during the break that we've been able to answer them properly. Um, let's try to get started again. Uh, let's see. Let me open back my slides and here we go. So before the break, we talked about hash functions and how we can use them to basically map whatever we like, be it strings, be it integers, be it points, whatever we've got, and map them onto indices in an array. Now that's very great. Uh, we can use these to make what we call hash tables. Um, but what we actually want is the idea of hash maps. So hash maps are the implementation that Python uses for its dictionaries. So let's see how we can construct one of those. Let's see how we can implement the map ADT. Remember the thing I showed you before with the size and the get key and the put key and the uh, delete a key and contains. Let's see how we can implement that using hash tables. And more importantly, let's see how we can do that uh, so that when we have good hash functions, we expect a runtime that is constant. Now, this is where it's going to be a bit trickier. Remember that when we took a look at quicksort, I said that the expected runtime of quicksort is n log n. Well, we're going to have a similar scenario here where the expected runtime of our insertion, deletion, and removal, uh, uh, retrieval is going to be constant. But worst case, um, even if we have a really good hash function, we're throwing in all kinds of things that happen to map to the same value, it could still become a little bit bad. But we're going to try and minimize that. So how do we do that? Well, there's a couple of different options and they all rely on doing one thing, which is handling hash conflicts. So long as there are no conflicts, there are no issues. We can just put every value in a different place in our hash table and it's all gonna be fine. The question is, what do we do when such a conflict does occur, right? So when two different elements map to the same hash value, what can we do? Well, there's two options that I'd like to discuss with you. Uh, separate chaining, and probing, and in our case specifically, linear probing. So let's see how we can make those work. Let's start with separate chaining. Uh, or sorry, let's start with uh, just the basics. So what does that mean? Well, that means um, that we have our class HashMap, and it's going to have some, let's say, default uh, things. So to start with, we create uh, a new table that's going to be our array or our, or our list, our hash table. It's going to have 11 places. They're all going to be empty. And the size is set to zero. Now, why do I pick this 11? Well, as it turns out, uh, but you might know more about this than I do, when we work with modular arithmetic, it's very nice to use prime numbers. There are some very nice mathematical properties, again, that I'm sure you know way more about than I do, or at least you're going to know way more about than I do after finishing your degree. Um, so that when using these uh, prime numbers as modular, uh, in our modular arithmetic, right, as the size of our table, we can reduce the number of conflicts. Now then we have uh, len, right, to get the size of our uh, hash map, the number of elements that are in it. We have a hash function, so given a key, what do we do? Well, we hash the key, but we also want to make sure that it is within this certain range, right? So remember, a hash function would map it to somewhere between 0 and n minus 1. That's exactly what we're doing here, where our n is uh, the size of our table. So to start with, it is that 11. Then we need to have a way to get something out. Well, what do we do? Uh, we hash uh, the key. So for example, if I say get me the value that goes with Stefan, then the key k would be Stefan. So first thing I do is hash it. 
And then I say, well, whatever underlying structure I've got, I want you please to get at probably index J a certain value for the key Stefan. And of course, we can also put an item. Um, again, I first determine where should it go by hashing our key. And then I say, okay, put it in there. And now there is one more important thing I do, which is related to a thing that we call the load factor. What do we do? Well, we say, if the size is larger than the size of the array divided by two, meaning I'm using more than half of the places in my array, then it's time to resize. At that point, conflicts could start occurring more. More than half of the places are taken. Uh, well, our hash function has the restriction that it needs to map them between zero and n minus one. Um, and at this 50%, that's our threshold for saying, okay, stop. We could run into conflicts far too often. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna make my table, my underlying table, twice as big. This is a little bit similar to how these array-based lists work that we've studied, right? When they were full, we would multiply their size by two and copy everything over. Well, in this case, when this thing is full, then we make it twice, or when this thing is half full, we make it twice as big and we copy everything over. So that means that looking at this, um, the way this is gonna work is gonna depend on this lines 15 and lines 19, getting things into bucket and putting or getting things from buckets and putting something in buckets. So what can we do? Well, we can use separate chaining, and that's the method we've been studying so far. So separate chaining is the idea that every bucket is simply a linked list. Um, and therefore, if one bucket needs to hold more than one item, so if two items map to the same, uh, have the same hash, yeah, that's fine, we can just put them in the linked list. That's the easiest method to implement, um, but of course there is some overhead involved in reserving some space for these linked lists. Now, uh, I would like to practice this. I've set up something that I hope can qualify as somewhat of a blackboard. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna give you, let's say one minute or so while I get set up, to see if you can draw me what this looks like. So it's going to be one of these boxes that we've seen before, right? Uh, with indices and then places in the array. And I'd like to know which of these keys goes where. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna give you a minute or so while I get set up and then we'll take a look together. And just as I want to start showing you the Blackboard app that I tried to install on a tablet, it's telling me, you didn't pay for me, so I'm running an ad. So we all need to wait another 12 seconds before I can enable that. Apologies for that, but it gives you a little bit more thinking time. Now, let's see, I want something like this. And I want something like this. So let's see if this works. I'm gonna move over my keyboard a bit. And I'll see if I can draw here and make that work. Seems to. 
Good. So I'm going to be looking down for this because I need to be looking at the tablet. So sorry for that, but we'll make it work to the best of our abilities here. So we have um, a map of a fixed size of 10. So we have indices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Right, and that's it. There is, uh, these are the things we can put stuff in. And what are we going to do? Well, every bucket is a linked list. It can just hold more items as needed. So consider the first key. The first key is one. Well, our hash function says it's uh, two times one plus three. Okay, that's five. So in place number five, that's over here, we start a new linked list and we put in the first thing, we put in a one. Okay, it looks like I can't move the text lower, but I'll start moving the, I'll just start writing the rest lower. So f of two is two times two plus three, that's seven. So in place number seven, we start a new linked list with two. If anything about this is unclear, please feel free to ask questions about it in Twitch chat. In the meantime, I'm just going to continue. Now f of seven is two times seven plus three, uh, that's 17. But that's a small problem because our list only has 10 spaces. Well, remember our trick from earlier? I can just modulo this with the size of my list in this case to get seven, to fit it inside of our hash table. So seven goes in the same place as the two, it goes here. Let's do two more. So f of 12 is two times 12 plus three, it's 27, 27 mod 10, it's also seven, so this also goes here. And maybe as our last one, let's do 20. Well, 27 isn't really interesting. Uh, let's do 19. So f of 19 is 2 times 19 plus 3 is 41. 41 mod 10 is 1. So 19 comes here. Quick question. Why is this hash function not a great choice? Why should we not use this one? Yeah, Brawl uh, had it. It doesn't seem to be that uniformly distributed. Um, but that could just be that the keys I'm currently choosing are a bit unfortunate. Yeah, so indeed skills, yeah, many collisions. But I like your answer, JMDBK. Great username to pronounce. Um, all the even indices are unused, right? So even if I pick keys so that the hash function tries to distribute them as well as possible, it can never map something to an even index because two times an integer plus three is always going to be odd. So there will never be any values that go here, 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 or here, meaning we are always wasting half of our capacity. So that's something to consider also in these hash functions, right? You want to distribute them uniformly and make sure that we can reach every square of, or every cell in our um, array. Otherwise, we're still gonna waste some space. Okay. Uh, yes, we were gonna do this on the board. We don't have a smart board available though, but well, we have something that uh, we'll sort of do in exchange, this tablet that I have in front of me. Are there any questions about uh, how I've drawn this? Q 
why it's all around. So I'm gonna assume not. Okay, then let's move on. Uh, yeah, let's move on. So we've seen one example of how we can make this separate chaining work on a piece of paper. Great. Um, let's take a quick look at how we could do something like this in uh, Python. Um, so how would it work? Well, remember we, we have this get from bucket and it gets uh, a hash, which is the index in our array. And we have a certain key. Now what it's gonna do, imagine that we call this with uh, get blah, 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 uh, eight, sorry, seven. Can I undo this? Yeah, there we go. Seven comma 12. What's it gonna do? Well, line four says first get me the bucket in place number seven. So get me this thing. And now we're gonna simply iterate through this whole list and see if indeed our key is in there. If it is, then we should return the value associated with it. So that's something I haven't drawn uh, in my diagram. In the diagram, I've only put the keys, but normally, right, in a dictionary or in a map, you would have a key value pair. Now, let me switch these around so that we can now talk about the other method. There we go. So in the other method, uh, if the slides are too small, also please let me know. I can make them bigger at the cost of losing more Blackboard space. But um, uh, yes, uh, big boy, uh, the great username also. The table itself is just one of these array-based lists. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what about put? Well, again, it's going to take a look at the place it needs to go. So let's say that we're putting something in uh, place number three. I want to put in there the key uh, zero, right? With our hash function from earlier, that still works. Two times zero plus three is indeed three. Then first thing it does on line 11 is it takes a look at this cell, almost the right place to draw that circle. It takes a look, a look at this cell and uh, it figures out, okay, is there already a list in here? At the moment there isn't, so then what does it do? It creates a new list. And now we need to check, okay, is the key already in this list? So that's the for loop from line 14 to 17. Because as you may already know from dictionaries, we can use a key only once. And if I again try to put something on the place of that key, I should update it instead of adding it. Right, in Python, if you have a dictionary, then if we do these two lines of code, one after another, it doesn't add a new entry, it updates the entry. So that's what the for loop is for in line uh, 14 to 17. But if we haven't found it in our list yet, then we should add it as a new place in our list with a key value pair. So that's separate chaining in Python. Any questions about that? While I make this a little bit bigger again, hide the tablet for now, and we'll be back to it later. Good, then let's see. So that's separate chaining. It's one way in which we can implement um, dealing with these hash conflicts. Another thing we could do is instead of using this idea of, okay, we have a conflict, what do we do? Well, just create a list, throw them all in there. We can use something that we call probing. 
Now, there's a whole variety of ways in which you can implement this, but I want to take a look at linear probing with you. So what's linear probing? Well, we try the same thing, right? So, okay, we need to put something in place six, put it in place six. Problem, play six is already taken. Then what do I do? I try to put it in place seven. If place seven is also taken, I try to put it in place eight. And I continue this way around, looping back, right? So in our example of size 10, if place nine is also taken, I go back to place zero and I try to place it there. And I continue with this until I found the place to put it. Now, that's uh, great, but it is a little bit harder to implement, as we will soon discover. Um, the benefit, however, is that we have no overhead at all in keeping track of these linked lists. So there is no extra space required at all. All we need is our table, our array-based list uh, to keep track of all of these places that we have. But there is no need for anything else. Now, let's again take the same keys uh, with the same hashes and let's try and put them into a table that, or a hash table or hash map that uses linear probing instead of this separate chain. Uh, Jochen, you have a very good question. What if all places are taken? Uh, we will discuss this uh, a bit later. Although Cisco is already giving you a nice answer too. So take a minute again, see if you can draw what this map looks like, uh, and I'll draw it for you in a moment. Okay, so I have my blackboard set up again. Let's see if we can try this once more. So once again, we have our map of size 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 indices. Uh, it's going to run another ad. Okay. Dang it. Okay, we need to hide the tablet for a second. Wait for this stupid ad to pass. I should look into getting a different application for next time. Fortunately, this was an ad I could cancel out of. So we're back a bit quickly, a bit more quickly. Let me just resize this. There we go. Okay. Uh, I could use Paint Finstar, but I'm I currently I'm using a tablet to draw on, and I need to somehow synchronize the tablet with my laptop or maybe my desktop. It's it's quite a messy setup, but. I'm going to look into alternatives for later. Let's see if we can fix this. So f of 1 was 2 times 1 plus 3 is 5. So we put the 1 here. f of 2 was 2 times 2 plus 3 is 7. So we put it here. f of 7 was 2 times 7 plus 3. But we had to modulo 10 it to also get 7. Now problem, 
7 is already taken. So I can't put it there. Instead, I'll put it in the next available space. And we continue. f of 12, 12 times, oh, uh, yeah, this was correct. 2 times 12 plus 3 mod 10 is also 7. 7 is taken, 8 is taken, so I continue to the next one, and I put it there. f of 13 is 2 times 13 plus 3, that's 29, mod 10 is 9. 9 is taken, so I loop around and I put it at the start. And we can continue doing this for the others as well. One, one is not taken yet. 22, that's gonna be seven. Seven is taken, eight is taken, nine is taken, zero is taken, one is taken. So we have to put it all the way over here. And finally, 27 is two times 27 plus three. That's also seven. So all taken, so we have to put it over here. Now, why could this situation never happen for a real hash map? Well, because remember, when half of the positions are taken, we would resize it. And as soon as we resize this thing, we would have a size of 20. And therefore, when we copy over these values, some will change their position. For example, our, does this work? Yeah, it does work, this does work. Our 29 here, I'm not sure if this dot is in any way visible, it might be too small, but I hope it's okay. Maybe if I do, no, I'm afraid we'll have to make do with this. Uh, our 29 here, modulo 20 is still gonna be nine, but our uh, 17 here, modulo 20 is gonna be 17. So when we resize the table, we can also sometimes accidentally, if you will, reduce the number of collisions, simply because we have a bigger range available for our hash values to take. Okay, so we have this idea of linear probing. If a cell is taken, great, just put it in the next one. But that means it's gonna be a little bit harder to retrieve a value, because where do I need to look? Well, um, imagine, for example, that I want to get the key 22 back from this map that I've drawn. When I'm hash 22, I get seven. So I start looking here and I conclude, yeah, well, this isn't the one I'm looking for. Okay, but maybe something happened. Maybe I should continue to the next one. Well, this isn't it, but maybe something happened. Maybe I should continue to the next one. And so on and so forth. And then finally it will find 22. But now imagine that instead of looking for 22, I'm looking for 32. 32 is also going to hash to seven. Two times 32, 64 plus three, 67, modulo 10, seven. So it starts here, can't find it, moves on, moves on, moves on, moves on, moves on, moves on, still can't find it. And now it gets to an empty square. And that's interesting because an empty square means that it can no longer be in the map at all. It can stop looking. How do I know? Well, if it had been in there, it must have taken the next available space. Therefore, it would have taken this one. But this one is empty, so it's not in there. Unless, hmm, maybe 32 was in there, but we've deleted it from the map. Remember that delete, deleting a key, is also a, an option that we can, or an operation we can do on our map. So how should we deal with that? How could I make sure that looking for a key that doesn't exist can still be stopped as quickly as possible? Well, also, like I said, the idea is we start walking and we continue until we find the value or an empty place. But what happens when something has been deleted? Well, in those cases, what could we do? 
simply make the cell empty, set that cell to some special marker, always, well, there's, there's nothing really we can do, just check the whole thing. Uh, and while we're doing that, might as well start moving stuff backwards so that next time we don't have this empty cell to deal with, or every time we delete something, screw it all, we'll just rebuild the whole map. Feedback Fruits is happy to hear your answer. Another 10 seconds to give me an answer if you have one. Uh, Woof Woofus is already asking other good questions, right? If you delete entries and it gets below half filled, do we reduce? Well, similar, uh, do we reduce the size? Um, similar to what we did for our array lists. Uh, remember, we would grow when we were full, but we wouldn't shrink as soon as we reach half the space for an array list because this could lead to this notion of threshing. Where repeatedly moving one element and deleting one element could lead to us allocating more and less space every time. Similarly, uh, what we do here is we only reduce the size when less than a quarter of the elements is used. So yes, we definitely reduce the size as well, um, but not when less than half is filled, but unless when a quarter is filled. Okay, while the last few of you are inputting your answers, I am going to close the question and take a look. Okay, good to see that answer D at least wasn't picked at all. Uh, we have some confidence in our abilities by now. Surely we can do better than rebuilding the whole thing. Um, answer B and C are both quite popular, some for answer A. Well, remember, I kind of spoiled answer A a little bit already. Um, answer A, unfortunately, can't work because when we set it to none, uh, for Python, it would mean that, for example, if our 19 was going to be removed, setting it to none, meaning erasing it, is going to mean that when it looks for this value 22 now, it's going to start here, 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 here. It gets to an empty cell, and so it will stop looking. So setting it to none won't work. I like both uh, answers B and C quite a bit. So B is set the index to some special marker. What we could do is we could say, oh, that's not what I meant to hit. We could say this thing is special, which I cannot write for some reason, but there we go. And so what do we do when looking for 22? We come across this thing. Well, it's not empty, so we better continue looking and then we find 22 later. Alternatively, indeed, we could move on and see if required whether we can move stuff back. But that, unfortunately, is going to be very, very messy to implement. We're going to need to rehash a whole bunch of keys. Um, we're going to need to do a lot of movement. It could work, but it's much easier in general to just mark them as special. So that's what we do. And instead of calling them special, we call them defunct. So I'm just going to put the letter D in to represent that. So whenever a cell has been removed, we make it, we mark it as defunct. An item was once here. However, conflicts should, could still come after this. Now, what does that mean for our code in Python? 
it's a little bit less easy to read than what we had before for our uh, separate chaining implementation. But for linear, program, for linear probing, this is how we can make it work. Let's start with get. So long as the thing that we are at, so imagine that we're getting 22. So long as the thing that we're at, and we start of course at the hash of 22, which is seven. So long as it's not none, well it's not none, and it's also not defunct, move on. Uh, oh, that's a small mistake in my slides that I should correct. So while it's not none or while it's defunct, right? Because even for defunct keys or defunct cells, we should move on. So first we take a look at the two, it's not none. So we take a look at line number eight. Is this the key we're looking for? No, we're looking for key 22, so we move on. It's not none. Is this the thing we're looking for? No, we're looking for 22 and not seven, so we move on. Is 12 the thing we're looking for? No, we're looking for 22, not 12. 13, nope. Now we get to a defunct cell, and this is a mistake I should correct in my slides. Um, so a defunct cell means that we should recognize it's defunct, but still move on. And then we get to 22, where line eight will finally be true, and we return the value corresponding to key 22. Then we also have put, which does exactly the same thing, right? It looks for the right place. If it can find it, great, we can update it. And if it cannot find it, then line 19 says, whatever place I've ended up with at the last bit, that's where I'll put it. Questions about this code? Good question, Jochen. So how does this line work where I change J? So line 10 and line 18. Um, so what I do here is I just move over to the next one, right? So I go from uh, cell number seven to, for example, cell number eight, cell number eight to cell number nine. But then there's also this modulo. So that's what the percentage symbol represents to make sure that from nine, I don't go to 10, but I go back to zero. Does that make sense? All right, good. Any other questions about this? I haven't seen them for, until now, so I guess not. I thought there was a way to... No, maybe not. Okay. Good. Then let me make my slides a little bit bigger again and start wrapping up here. There we go. Because uh, there's one uh, problem that could maybe occur. What happens when the map's completely full, right? Uh, either we never find an empty cell loop forever. Maybe the list is always at most 50% full. Maybe the last entry of the list is always empty or no clue. Feedback Roots is happy to hear your answer while the tablet is playing another poker ad.
Okay, 10 more seconds to give me an answer if you have one. And let's take a look. Yeah, so indeed we talked about it a little bit already, right? Uh, so answer, if you only look at the code, then answer A seems to be the likely answer because it's a well continue so long as uh, it's not none. So continue so long as we haven't found an empty cell. However, um, something that we did in our hash table implementation is that when half of them are used, we wanted to maintain this thing called a load factor so that at most half would be used. So as soon as we reach this threshold, we'll make ourselves twice as big, meaning every single moment, at most 50% of the entries are used. Uh, and for that purpose, defunct entries um, could still be considered a part of that. Now, someone asked uh, via Feedback Fruits, and thank you, Denny, for also repeating it in chat. I'll be checking the questions in Feedback Fruits in a moment, uh, but it's good to already see it. If you add something, um, can you also add it in a defunct bucket? So that's a good question, right? Because this notion of defunct means something used to be here, now it no longer is. So it seems like maybe we can reuse it. Well, we could, but we have to be very careful. So let's see if my poker ad has finished playing. Um, and it seems to have. Consider, for example, uh, let me update this back to show you very quickly the tablet again. Mm, just going to put it on top of my slides for a second. Consider that I might want to reuse this defunct entry. Then what happens now if I now do put 27, right? Oh. Put 27. 27 maps to index 7, so it's going to start here and going to look for a place. It now finds this defunct cell. What it could do is it could say, okay, then that's where I'll put it. So I'll put 27 in here. Oh, uh, in here. My sheet of paper has moved on the tablet, so the paper no longer corresponds to the screen. I'll put the 27 right here. Problem is, that 27 is already in the table. And by stopping at our first defunct cell and saying, I'll put it in. Thanks, Skills. Turns out you can't see the blackboard. All right, uh, here we go. Let's try this again. So we have our table from before. Sorry for that, we'll, we'll get there. I'm executing put 27. Uh, 27 hashes to index 7. So we start looking over here. We look, we look, we look, we find a defunct cell. So we might now say, okay, great, that's where I'll put it. I'll put 27 in here. However, in doing that, we stop looking at the rest and we don't figure out that 27 is actually already in there. And so we should be updating instead of putting it in again. So something that many implementations do to be able to reuse these defunct cells is they keep track of the first usable defunct cell, but still continue checking, okay, is it anywhere in there? And then when they find an empty cell, they put the value in the first defunct cell, if that makes sense. So yes, we can reuse defunct cells for adding, but it makes the code even less trivial. I don't know who asked the question in Feedback Fruits, but if there's more questions about this explanation, uh, please, by all means, let me know.
audio is not working. All right, here we go now. <sighs> Running into more misclicks than last time. Sorry for that. Uh, you could hear my whole explanation about the Blackboard stuff, right? Or was I muted for that entire time? Okay, good, good. Um, so let me uh, wrap it up. So this is not gonna be an issue. We just resize the map when we are at the risk of being half full. Why did we do that? We did that to reduce the chance of having these collisions, right? As soon as we have a larger range, there's more different places something can go. So the chances of collisions become a little bit smaller. Uh, and as soon as 50% is being used, that's our threshold for saying, okay, the chances of colliding are going to become too big. So now we make ourselves bigger. We can spread the keys more equally. That means that today we saw an implementation of a map or in Python, a dictionary with the function size, get, put, remove, and contains that can all run due to the magic of this hashing in expected or theta one time. But worst case are all still theta n. Remember our terrible hash function that just maps everything to the same hash. So what does this runtime depend on? Well, only one thing, namely, how well does our hash function perform for our input? It doesn't matter whether we use separate chaining or linear program uh, probing in terms of uh, time complexity, but fewer hash conflicts will always mean a better performance. And so um, the one thing we should look at when using these things is how can we efficiently and effectively hash our keys. Okay. Then this lecture was going to be about hash maps, but also hash sets. Um, so let me very quickly talk about them. How can we uh, implement that? Well, it's actually very easy. Um, a set is just a dictionary, but with only keys. So we call these things hash sets, and they are hash maps that do not store any value for a key. So with a good hash function, that means we can do insertion, deletion, as well as contains in uh, constant time. So sets are really nothing more than dictionaries without values. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to type them either into feedback routes or chat now while I do the last bit of wrapping up. So today we talked about hashing, we talked about hash maps. Later this week, we'll be talking about graphs uh, and before the end of the course, still about P versus NP. What can you now do? Well, uh, this doesn't apply. Uh, I should take a look at the grading of your digital as well as written exam before Friday. You can take a look at chapter 10. So chapter 10 is all about sets and maps uh, and hashing. Uh, before Sunday, there will be some new homework for you to work on. Now, uh, last thing that I wanted to uh, discuss here, tomorrow morning, we will have a tutorial. Uh, we are currently looking into another system that would allow you to also use your microphones to ask me questions. I can direct who would be the one talking, stuff like this. I'm not quite sure we can get that working before tomorrow morning. So for tomorrow morning, we will very, very, very likely be using Twitch again for our tutorial, which I realize is far from ideal, but yeah, like I said, we'll have to make do. Um, if you have any questions about how the course is going to be organized, anything like that, please post them on the Brightspace forums. And if you have any questions now, uh, I can stick around for a couple more minutes to answer them. Let me see if any have been asked via feedback fruits already. Yes. Um, is the bad hash function uh, on squared? So this was probably about our intermezzo. Let me see if I can uh, find that back. So our intermezzo, we have this bad hash function. Is it gonna be a quadratic time to add them? Uh, and I think you're quite right uh, in asking that. Because um, yeah, what's gonna happen 
is that uh, we first need to check is it in there already because we are only we are not allowed any duplicates and then we can add it so every well, this is going to be our gauss sum right the first one can be added instantly the next one requires checking one element and then adding it so two time steps the next one three four five and so on and so forth so indeed this would be quadratic what else um, if you resize a hash table, do you recalculate the index of every key? Yes. Yes, you have to, because we now have this larger range, right, of keys that we can accept. Uh, we need to see for every one, will the key change now that we have this larger range? So yeah, resizing means recalculating for every key. And finally, can you add something also to a defect bucket, uh, defunct bucket? I hope I answered that one already. Um, Okay, there was one more thing that uh, came into uh, chat just now. Yeah, will this? Uh, when will this stream be uploaded to YouTube? Um, yeah, I will basically uh, start that upload process as soon as I click the end recording button in a second. Uh, so anywhere within the next hour, and I'll link it to on Brightspace. Right, there was one last thing I wanted to mention. I wrote it down in front of me and my eye happened to catch it just now. Um, for our tutorials, normally I give you some homework, right, to prepare. Um, I wanted to prepare two short videos that you should watch based on Kaleshigama material from last year. I haven't gotten around to setting these up because I've been so busy with setting up all this other stuff. Um, so not to worry, for tomorrow's tutorial, there is nothing to prepare. We will spend probably the first half doing some exercises related to hash maps, hash sets, stuff like this. Um, and then the second half, I will give you an introduction to graphs. It will unfortunately be less tutorial setting than my tutorials normally are. Uh, it will be a little bit more lecturing, but I hope that's okay. And I hope we can make that work. Last question for today from Jochem. Is there an average case or amortized runtime for those hash tables? So uh, like, uh, quick sort. There isn't really an amortized way to, to talk about these things. Uh, in spec, what we have is what we call an expected runtime. Uh, so we expect the operation to be constant time, provided we have a good hash function. Similar to how we expect quick sort to be n log n, uh, provided we pick our pivots uh, somewhat okay. Okay. I'll stick around for a couple more minutes in chat if you have questions there. Otherwise, you can post them on Brightspace. And I'll see you tomorrow at 10.45 back here on Twitch to do a tutorial session. See you then.